I entitled this uh, lecture as, as the laws of networks and let's for a second just fix our ideas what type of laws we're talking about and what type of networks we're talking about. One of the networks that we are all, we're all of us familiar with is really the social network. And this is a depiction of how we are connected through Facebook. This is actually a visualization put out by Facebook itself that shows how their user base links to each other. And of course, there's no way you can show all the links so it gives you the major forces between the different continents and shows you some very exciting stuff like you know, big dark forces out there that are not on Facebook at all. <laughs> but then we, when we talk about networks, we also talk about technological networks, how the routers on the internet link to each other through physical cables. So these are infrastructural networks, really, that, that one that costs millions of dollars each of the links and really are behind much of our ability to communicate so seamlessly today. And we also talk about biological networks, the networks within ourselves that are responsible for maintaining what we call life, but whose breakdown is responsible for specific diseases. And these are the type of networks that really biologists and medical doctors study when they try to find the, you know, the next cure to cancer or at all the mechanism that is responsible for the emergence of cancer. Now, one of the things if you look at these networks that you may notice is that they look for all practical purposes to be random, as if they are randomly wired together. They're very complicated, they are very large, and it seems almost impossible to extract any order from them. And indeed, for about 40 years, much of our thinking about these networks assumed that they are truly random. That is that we start out, if you want to model them, you start out with a bunch of disconnected nodes, and then with a certain probability, you just throw links between them and connect them to each other. And the idea is that if you just put a few links between them, they will be disconnected. But as you add more and more links, then clusters will start to merge. And one of the, one of the discoveries from a ne random network paradigm was that networks don't emerge gradually, but emerge rather suddenly. If you have sufficient number of links, suddenly you will have a network. And that transition will be a very, un a very fast transition. But what I really want to talk about is not as much how these networks emerge, but as much as really how do they look like. Because the paradigm behind that is the assumption that these networks are random. And do we really believe that these networks could be random? And the answer is no. Much of the systems that we deal with are not random. So therefore, that order that be is behind the system should be reflected in the structure of the network behind them. So what I'm going to do is that I will present you about five or six laws of networks that I call them laws because these are principles that describe the behavior of a wide range of networks. And there are many more, you know, but uh, I, I knew usually have about two, uh, one law per two minutes. So given the amount of time I was allocated, I give you only five or six. So <clears throat> the first law is really the sm this well known as the six degrees or the small world property. And the idea is that if you pick any two individuals in the social network, like Sarah and Peter, they may not know each other, but Sarah knows Ralph, Ralph knows Janet, Jens knows Peter, and therefore there's a short path between them. And the observation that really goes back to 1929 is that no matter where you pick these two individuals around the Earth, there will be a relatively short distance between them. The, you know, the aha uh -huh, small word feature, you know, like has, or, or it's also called the six degrees property. The assumption here is that the distance between any two randomly uh, chosen individuals is about six. This is an old number. We believe the real number is around four, you know, uh, given the modern technologies that we have to measure it. But down the line, what matters is the distances are small. This is not specific to social networks. On the World Wide Web, any of two web pages would have a very relatively short path between them. Uh, in the cell, any two chemicals can be connected by a few reactions and so on. And <clears throat> Now, that's one key feature of networks, but there's another one that is equally important, which is what we call the scale-free property. And to illustrate that, let me give you two examples of networks that really give you the difference. So the random network would be a little bit like the highway system of United States, where the nodes are the cities and the links are the highways between them. And that's a relatively uniform network in the sense that most cities have two or three highways going in and out and you don't find any major city with hundreds of highways and you don't find any with not, not at least a few links uh, to them. In contrast, 
Most real networks don't look like that. They look a bit like the airline system, where there are many, many small airports and a few major hubs hold many, many nodes together. And, in, uh, you know, and these networks today I call it skill-free networks. And you know, obviously, the presence of the hubs fundamentally determines how these networks behave and how you deal with these networks. And one simple example, when you go from East Coast to the West Coast, you're going to have to go through many, many nodes if you drive. But if you fly, you just go to the hub and you arrive to your destination. Now, this is not a property of the airline networks only. We originally discovered it on the World Wide Web, where Google and uh, Facebook and other major hubs called many, many small web pages together. But it's also present in technological networks. So this is the physical infrastructure behind the internet, where the nodes are routers and the links are the physical cables between them. And you can see the basic features of the skill-free property. Here are a few major hubs that hold many, many peripheral nodes together. And in most real networks that really matter to us, from biological networks to technological to social networks, we see the natural emergence of the hubs. The next question, why do we have hubs? And that takes us to the third law, which is the, we have hubs because there's a rich get richer phenomena taking place in most networks. To understand the origins of, loves, uh, of hubs, we need to figure out how do the networks themselves emerge in the first place? And it turns out, and that's obviously easy to understand, that most networks are the result of some kind of growth process. You cannot have a network with millions of nodes that have not really emerged by adding one node at a time. Think of the World Wide Web, that 20 years ago, you know, there was no web, and now we have more than a trillion pages. We went one to a trillion by adding one page at a time. But there's a second property that is equally important when it comes to the emergence of networks. New nodes don't choose democratically where they connect. They tend to connect to hubs. They tend to choose hubs. It's not an absolute rule. It's what we call preferential attachment, that there is a bias towards the hubs. We can still connect on the World Wide Web to our best friend's web page, which may not be a hub. But we tend to know highly connected pages, and we tend to connect to what we know, which is bias towards the hubs. Now, if you put these things together, you will see a network emerging through growth and preferential attachment. And you will see that the hubs naturally emerge through a rich gets richer phenomenon. And that simply says that if one node has many more links than the other one, when the new nodes arrive, they will much easily find the bigger nodes and connect to that than the small one, because those are hard to find. And therefore, the big nodes will grow faster than the smaller ones. So what we have learned in the last 10 years about networks is that most networks, or pretty much all of them who have hubs, have emerged through these two rules. They are the result of growth process, and there is some preferential attachment in the system. And they together are responsible for hubs. If you are missing any of them, you will not have hubs in, their, in these real systems. Now the next question you may ask is, so what? Does it really matter that we have hubs in these real systems? And one of the things we learned in the last decade is that they matter. They matter a lot. They fundamentally change the behavior of the system. And some of the speakers who will speak after me will probably uh, talk a bit about the power of the hubs. I'll tell you one particular example, which is their impact of, on robustness. What do I mean by that? And that takes me to my fourth law, is that complex systems have this amazing ability to carry on their basic functions even when some of their components are broken. As I'm talking to you, there are probably millions of errors in my cells, and luckily, I don't notice it. And on the internet, at any moment, there are hundreds of routers who are not working. They may be fixed in 10 minutes. They may be fixed in two days. But the internet as a wall can function. And I'm sure in your organizations, there are probably dozens of people who at any moment are on vacation or they're just not paying attention, yet your organization doesn't fall apart. So the question is, why can these complex systems maintain their properties, you know, their functionality, why components are missing? And to test that, we can ask, what happens if nodes break down in the system? So let me show you the scale-free network that we built earlier and start randomly removing the nodes. And what you realize if you do that is that the network is shrinking, but it doesn't really want to break apart. Now, why is it surprising that the network doesn't want to break apart? Because we have a bunch of theories from the 1960s telling us 
that if you randomly break down nodes in a random network or in a regular lattice like a square lattice, then the network will inevitably break apart once you remove a sufficient number of nodes. And it's easy to understand. If you remove a few nodes, it doesn't matter. But if you remove more and more nodes, you will destroy the network's integrity. And each network has its own critical point that is a fraction of the nodes beyond which it cannot survive. It will fall apart. Scale-free networks don't have that critical point. You can remove 90% of the nodes and the remaining 10% are still holding together. And that's because of the hops. If you are removing truly the, the nodes, like closing ran randomly down the airports, what airports would be closing down randomly? Well, you'd be closing down the small airports because there are so many of them. Your chance of closing down a big one is very small because there are very small, a few hops. And therefore, what you will do is that you will shrink the network. You will reduce traffic everywhere, but your chance of really destroying the network is really close to zero. And this is what we call the extreme robustness built into these networks, but there's a price you pay for that. What if you don't remove the nodes randomly? What if you go and attack? What if you start with the biggest node, and then the next biggest node, and the next biggest node? And because these networks so much rely on the hops, with the removal of the few hops, you have actually effectively destroyed your network. So let's compare these two systems. We started from the same network. On the right hand side, well, left hand side, we remove 24 nodes randomly, and the network is still together. On the right, we remove 10 nodes, and we destroyed our network. This is what we call the Achilles Hill property of uh, these networks. They are very random to, uh, they are very fr uh, fragile to attacks, but they are very robust against random failures. And this is a generic property for many, many real networks. And this is one example how the hops matter. This is clearly thanks to the fact that we have hops in these systems. Now, you can destroy the network or the functionality of the network before breaking it into pieces. And the question is, how is that happening? And how do we think about that? That takes me to the fifth law, which I would call vulnerability due to interconnectivity. And the best example is the, uh, uh, is essentially the power grid, where you know local breakdowns lead to you know large failures across the whole power grid, and that's an example of how networks can export local problems and make them fully global, and you know and that's again a feature not only of the power grid but much of the financial crisis we see today is the result of such a of such a cascading failures that spread along the network. If we would have not had financial networks, problems would have stayed local and could have not spread around the world. Now, uh, the, what, what I would like to do next is to show you actually how some of these ideas are being applied today, which kind of leads to my sixth law, which I would call the power of maps. And I want to convince you that maps, network maps are extremely powerful uh, when it comes to our ability to understand the system. And this is a very good example to get started to understand that. This, these are the employees of a company, a mid-sized company in Hungary that work in three different locations in the capital. Those are the purple people and two off, uh, 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 locations outside of the capital. And this company had a major communication problem. The CEO and the higher management has realized that every time they would make a decision, not that these decisions would not get to the workers, but often the opposite message would get to them. So they wanted to understand what is going on. How could we fix this problem? So therefore, they called some of my colleagues uh, from a company that I'm part of in Hungary, Maven 7, and they said, could you help us understand what's going on in the organization? Well, having a list of employees and their roles is useless. What we need is a network. So what we ended up doing is that we ended up asking everybody, whom do you turn for information about company matters? Whom do you turn to advise? Who, where do you get actually the news of what's happening within the company? Who delegates jobs to you? And whom do you delegate jobs to? And that transformed this list into a network. And you suddenly start seeing the different roles of individuals within the organization. There are a couple of major hubs that have a huge influence on the rest of the company. That's where the information is coming from or through who is spending. Now, you would hope that the hubs would be the people that you care about and who should have the right information. So let's see who are the hubs. So we're going to color based on the role in the company. The red guys is the CEO and the directors. And you don't see any red hubs there. 
The next level down is the blue, which is the top manager. And I'm sure in this room there's nobody below that, and yet you don't see any blue hops here. <laughs> and then if you look carefully, it turns out that the hops are the bottom of the hierarchy. And, you know, of course, we know who these hops are, but they have a huge influence. Look at that middle guy, and, you know, he's actually already a worker. He's two degrees away from everybody within the company, no matter what branch of the company is and where it is. He has links to everybody but the higher management. <laughs> so the question is, who is he? And, well, he turns out to be the, the person in charge of health and safety in the company. His role is to go from group to group and talk to everyone and make sure that the laws are prop and you know there's health and safety issues or, or, or taken care of. He is a horizontal news spreader, actually. He picks up on information there, passes out the word there. He has no re reliable information. He spreads what he hears. Now, what do you do in this case? Do you fire him? Well, it's not his job. It's not his fault, actually, what happened. The higher management left what we call a structural hole within the company. And this person has naturally actually filled in. The simple answer to this problem, talk to him. Tell him what's going on, have a coffee with him, and the two other three hops in the network, and suddenly the right information will be spreading in the system. So this is one way to think about you know, how you can use the, the, uh, you know, these maps and the power of the maps. And that takes me to my last law, the, the seventh law, which is controllability. Can we really control networks? And what do we mean by control? And one good example would come from a car. A car has about 6,000 components, yet we can control a car from three components, the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake. If you have access to that, you can make the car to go from anywhere to anywhere with any speed that car can do. So the question is really, you know, how do we think about control in a, car, in a car or in a complex system? And of course, the car is designed to be controlled from these three components. And I urge you not to buy any car that cannot be controlled from these three components. <laughs> but the question is that if I would give you the wiring diagram of the car, could you find where are the three components that you need to control to control the car if you don't know anything about how to build the car? And, and it may sound like a stupid question to worry about that, how do I find the control points, but this is the type of question that you need to ask when you are in charge of a new organization. Who are the control points? Who are the people I need to talk to to take them along with my vision, to transform the organization to go where I want to go? So one of the things we have do done in the last few years is to develop tools to identify the control points in a, comp in a, in, in a map like that. And what I'm going to show you next is that what is flickering are the non-control points. That is, the people whose position in the organization is such that they don't actually play a control in the system. And the reason I'm flickering them is because I want you to see that most nodes are in this category. But there are a few other nodes who are now highlighted in red who are really control points. And what I'm showing you is that the tools of network science helps to start asking questions really, how do I change a system? Where do I intervene? And, you know, and eventually will help us to really turn these ideas into actionable items. So with that, I'll just show you some of these laws. If you give me an hour, I can give you 15 more. But down the line, these give you the most as the idea that networks are not random. Not random means that they have quantifiable principles. Behind each of these laws, there is a formula that quantifies what we're talking about. And if you understand these principles, you have a huge advantage in, uh, in understanding the complex world around us, you. And the rest of the speakers will probably put these ideas into practice and show how some of these things can be applied in some other domains of application. Thank you very much.